Hello, my name is Geneviève Vachon. I'm the director of the Living in Northern Quebec Research Partnership and professor of urban design at Université Laval School of Architecture. This is a short and unassuming capsule about the work we're doing with indigenous communities of Quebec's Northern Territories. The North is quite popular these days. One only has to pass through a few airports in Nunavik to realize how many architects, builders, and all sorts of consultants and organizations are involved in the North. At the 2019 Arctic Circle Conference in Reykjavik, the leitmotiv was Greenland is open for business. Closer to home, the Plan Nord announced the opening of the North as a model of sustainable development. Yet, these expressions suggest that the North is empty, that it is the New Wild West or a kind of El Dorado. Well, it's not. The territories of Nunavik and Nitasinan have been the Inuit and the Inu's home for millennia. These territories are places where knowledge and ideas and ingenuity abound. They are also quite open to intercultural dialogue about innovation and creativity with regards to housing and placemaking. This capsule is uh, presented on behalf of Living in Northern Quebec. We are a research partnership funded by SHIRC since 2015, and we are anchored at Université Laval School of Architecture. Living in Northern Quebec is an interdisciplinary team of 20 co-investigators and 40 student researchers from five Canadian and French universities. In addition, there are architecture firms as well as 15 partner organizations, which include Inu and Inuit organizations and communities located north of the 49th parallel. In a nutshell, our mission is to reflect on the culturally adapted living environments of the Nitasinan Inus and the Nunavik Inuit through collaborative approaches, including design research. Over the years, we have mobilized some 600 stakeholders from the north and south, including about 230 architecture students around Innovative uh, projects for housing mainly, along with a few decision-making tools. You can see more of these projects and results on our main, main web page. Our work with the Inuit of Nunavik and the Inu of Nitasinan aims to highlight and discuss the qualities of environments that resemble them and that adhere to their values and ambitions. It addresses contemporary and vernacular architecture, landscapes, perceived and experienced, practices and know-how from both applied and scientific angles, but always with the idea of thinking differently. In the end, our partnership paints a very optimistic portrait of the North, a portrait that reveals richness and promise within Inu and Inuit communities, well beyond the problems, which are certainly very real, but often monopolize media attention. It's recognized by now that housing development models in Inuit Nunavik are not socially, culturally, environmentally, nor economically sustainable. Of course, demographic pressures raise several concerns, including missing housing units and overcrowding. There is also a lack of variety in house types and tenures, as well as premature wear and tear. Currently, Social housing and single family types are the norm in Nunavik, with no real opportunity for residents to choose either the house or its location in the village. At the same time, Inuit youth readily say that they aspire to alternatives. In fact, more Inuit are questioning the adaptation of their house to their practices, aspirations, and values. In short, everything that gives meaning to dwelling and the important relationship they maintain with the land. That said, there are efforts to set up a homeownership program. It is slowly taking off, despite challenges posed, among others, by access to a mortgage on a lot that one does not own. Planning and construction in Nunavik is usually carried out in a hurry. Everything is done within very short time frames, conditioned by programs, the climate, by deliveries by boat when the ice has subsided, or by a fly-in, fly-out construction system. 
To make things quick or economical, standard house models and materials important from the South are used and repeated and do not reflect cultural specificities. The harsh reality of housing production in Inuit villages is largely driven by a desire to meet the needs of the greatest number of people, with quality and cultural adaptation often suffering in the process. So repetitive housing models are built on permafrost, bypassing rocky ridges, which causes a, a form of sprawl. In larger, larger villages, many families living far from daily services and schools are dependent on a car or ATV. However, uh, melting permafrost within and near villages is turning previously solid ground into hazard zones. This imposes costly ways of building, most often on what are called pads. Now, pads are a thick layer of gravel, about three feet deep, to shield the permafrost from heat transfer. Houses are also jacked up on supports. As pads are spread, they eradicate all of the fragile vegetation cover, including berry picking areas. This also dramatically alters the landscape and ways of relating to the land. But now uh, Nunavik's local government and municipalities are sounding the alarm about a gravel shortage. So the need to build and plan differently is even more pressing. At the same time, the absence of underground water and sewer pipes in permafrost zones implies that each building is completely autonomous and equipped with tanks and also imposing mechanical rooms. The tanks are serviced by trucks seven days a week and around the clock, while being a source of employment in areas where that is cruelly lacking. Um, this complex management system is often the cause of serious problems such as heating breakdowns, frozen plumbing, overflow water tanks, um, or equipment breakdowns. Since the villages of Nunavik are not connected to the Hydro-Quebec network, electricity is produced by diesel power plants, so dependence on fuel for heating slows down efforts to improve energy use efficiency and to reduce GH GHGs. Innovations are there, uh, including wind, water, and solar power generation, but they are very slow coming. The form of Nunavik villages echoes that of suburbs in the south, yet the Inuit way of life adapts. Uh, gaps between aligned houses are places where daily activities take place for play, work, storage, socialization. What is missing, according to our Inuit partners, is direct contact with the land. While some have access to a family cabin on the land, main, many do not. Also lacking are places where to affirm the bonds of family and neighborhood solidarity, where to do traditional activities like butchering, preparing and sharing meals, drying skins, sewing or crafts, and to pass on this knowledge to the next generations. Overall, we hear people deploring a lack of control over their own living environment, and have a say in the development and shaping of their village. Since 2015, the Living in Northern Quebec team aims to understand, listen, and dialogue with the Inus and the Inuit in order to mobilize and translate new co-produced knowledge into design projects to be discussed and questioned. This is usually carried out in design workshops or studios. We've conducted 13 architecture and urban design studios in five universities so far, plus a good number of design theses, all in collaboration with about a dozen communities. This design research access has produced a wide variety of proposals based on fieldwork, which includes observations, meetings with local experts, and feedback to and from the community whenever it's possible. As I'm speaking, you're seeing examples of projects which have investigated all sorts of challenges highlighted by the communities. They look into enhancing the uses of public space in villages, 
into the sense given to places for family gathering and sharing within the home and outside, into new programs such as youth houses, sharing space and time with elders. We've also looked into new building techniques inspired by local resources and capacities, into alternative housing types, tenures and densities, into new learning and knowledge sharing environments on the land or near the village. We've worked also on planning decision-making guides based on Inu and Inuit aspirations and know-how that take into account current governance frameworks, feasibility, and goals for self-determination. During the studios, architects and planners currently working in the North collaborate by sharing their own expertise and experience. In parallel, empirical research conducted on varied topics in different disciplines informs the designer's problem-solving approach. The collaborative design approach relies as much as possible on the co-presence of actors from the North and the South who represent a variety of interests. They are representatives of local organizations, elected officials, activists, youth, seniors, artists, or teachers. Up north, we meet in schools and in town halls, in community centers, or in homes. We go to meetings in the village or on guided treks on the land. Simultaneously, we learn fascinating stories and we are told of great wrongs. Here, the process of collaboration and trust building is as much a result as are the projects themselves. So this next generation of architects and urban designers we're training is open to intercultural exchange. The students are keenly aware that what's important is not about designing miracle solutions for, but rather working with communities while integrating different types of knowledge and visions of the world. In conclusion, the outcomes of living in Northern Quebec are quite varied. They include research results transferred through the usual academic outlets, numerous design proposals, which we've gathered into a book destined to local schools and organizations, online decision-making tools, and all sorts of mobilizing activities involving the young Inu and Inuit. In this latter context, we left modest tangible traces through design-build activities like the construction of play modules for schools in Nitestinam, as shown in the Mamou Metweta video also on this page. Such activities aim to motivate young people who are quite curious about how to take charge of and shape their own living environment. Overall, our results confirm the need to think differently about the North by inviting Indigenous communities to become involved in developing creative solutions based on their own aspirations, knowledge and know-how. Thinking and doing things differently also means putting an end to considering building from a narrow technical or budgetary rationale in order to push for and adopt people-centered paradigms which consider architecture fitting with culture as a premise for empowerment, self-determination, and sustainability.